Hello everyone and welcome, whether you are here in the room or far-flung places on Zoom. It's my very great pleasure to welcome you all wherever you may be. My name's Athena Donald and I'm the Master of Churchill College, which is hosting this event for the Alumni Festival. Uh, as it's a hybrid event, um, we are going to have at the end to try and balance questions from the literal floor and questions coming in on Zoom. Use the Q&A function, please, to put your questions in, and I will attempt to, to moderate between these two different streams. It is fantastic to have Professor Sir Colin Humphreys here today. Um, I was just reminiscing with Colin. I think I first met him when I was a PhD student. Um, I'm a physicist and my memory is I met him in Oxford where he spent a number of years, but a, a lot of his career has been here in Cambridge. He is in fact um, a Churchill alum. He was a graduate student here. Um, he is now emeritus professor in Cambridge, um, professor of material science, and is his day job as it were is at Queen Mary in London. He's had a very long and distinguished career covering different aspects of material science. I knew him as an electron microscopist, but more recently, he's been working on novel materials, um, having very successful spin-out companies. And um, one of these fantastic new materials is, of course, graphene, which is what he'll be talking to us about today. He's won many prizes during his career, most recently Royal Medal from the Royal Society, which is quite a big deal. It's one of the top medals from the Royal Society. So that is absolutely an accolade. And uh, as I say, today he's going to be talking about the magic of graphene. So Colin, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Athene. And it's a great pleasure and a privilege to be talking back at my own uh, college. And uh, Churchill has many happy memories for me and it's just had a wonderful birth and a growth to be, you know, a truly fantastic college. So thank you very much. A great pleasure to be here. Um, let me... Go to the next slide. So content of the talk, I'm going to give an introduction to graphene. And this is going to be, in fact, the whole talk is to be to scientists and non-scientists as well. So if you're a non-scientist, that's, that's great. And, that's, and welcome here and welcome to everybody. Um, then move on to the high expectations that everyone have for graphene, the hurdles for industrial application, my own involvement in graphene and the talk about serendipity in science. And so um, it really was, uh, Lucky chance, as it were, I got involved with graphene, I'll tell that story. And then um, a solution to these hurdles for industrial applications, we came up with a new method of producing graphene, a new growth method, MOCVD graphene. Now I'll talk a little bit about our company and our first product and what it might do, and then say something about future products or future possible graph graphene products. So graphene is a Nobel Prize winning material. And it's very unusual for a material to win a Nobel Prize. In 2010, two Russian scientists working at Manchester University, Andre Geim and Konstantin Novoselov, also known as Kostya Novoselov, they got the Nobel Prize. And this was a citation for groundbreaking experiments regarding the two-dimensional material graphene. So graphene is a two-dimensional material of carbon atoms. And a, a structural sort of model of graphene is it looks like carbon chicken wire, which is on the next slide, and we'll come back to this one. So this is a, what graphene looks like. If you go to a, um, a nursery, a uh, garden centre, not, not a nursery for children, go to, go to a garden centre and ask for chicken wire, this is a, what you'll get. And that's what graphene looks like, right? So there's a graphene, a carbon atom at each intersection of these pieces of wire joining the carbon atoms, as it were. And these are bits of wire, as it were, are like the chemical bonds in, in the graphene. And if you pile a layer of graphene on top of another and keep on piling them up, then you get graphite on the right. And similarly, if you strip off the top layer of graphite, then you get graphene. So graphene, it's the first material in the world in which all the atoms are like, lie in a single plane. And it's also the thinnest known material in the world. So it's a quite remarkable material and uh, a material which is a unique material. 
So just for people particularly who are not non-scientists, so what is carbon? So carbon is a chemical element with a symbol capital C. It's often called the king of the elements because it's really, if you ask anyone what the most important element is, the majority of people will say carbon. Last time I looked, there's 118 elements. Carbon uh, comes from the Latin carbo, which means coal. And carbon has existed and been known about since prehistoric times. And it's common to all known life. So all life, all animal life, all plant life contains carbon. It's everywhere in the human body, it's in our skin and our hair and our teeth and our blood, bones and muscles. If it's with us throughout our life. So the first baby clothes you wear contain carbon and your silk line or coffee made from something else also contains carbon. So it's there at your birth and your death as it were. And uh, when you breathe, you exhale carbon in the form of carbon dioxide. So, you know, we're all contributing to global warming when we inhale and exhale, when we exhale particularly. And when you kiss, carbon atoms embrace. So it's got a sort of romantic possibly overtones. So carbon is a really amazing element. And carbon is the constituent of dazzling diamonds through to the lead in your pencil. So diamonds, well, we'll come to this, diamonds very hard, and then your pencil rather soft. It's one of the most abundant elements on earth. 20% of our bodies are made from carbon. It's a sustainable element because there's so much of it in our earth. So if you use it up, you know, our earth's an almost inexhaustible supply. Um, and of course, recently, carbon's been in the news very much. So we have the COP26 United Nations Conference in Glasgow, uh, trying to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. But as you all know, recently, there's not enough carbon dioxide here on Earth or, because we have this financial time says a CO2 crisis. There's not enough carbon threatening a huge, huge range of industries from healthcare to food. So just this is a bit more scientific with scientists here. So diamond has a three dimensional cubic structure each atom is bonded to four other carbon atoms in what are called sp3 bonds. And it's a very hard structure because these bonds are very strong. All the electrons are used up in these bonds, so it's an electrical insulator. On the other hand, graphene is very different, although it's just composed of carbon atoms. It's a single layer of carbon atoms in this chicken wire array. Each carbon atom in graphene has what's called sp2 bonding to other in plane, three other in plane carbon atoms. So diamond sp3, graphite, graphene sp2, so there's an electron left over, and that those electrons float above and below this, this, graph, this carbon plane, and they're delocalized, called pi orbitals, and so they're free to move easily. So graphene is an excellent electrical conductor, whereas diamond is an electrical insulator. So though diamond and graphene have exactly the same element, carbon, it's the bonding which is responsible for their properties. And um, so this is really very important for, gra for graphene. Graphite, as we saw in the drawing, is many layers of carbon, sorry, many layers of graphene stacked vertically, is what's called AB stacking. And the bonding between the layers is called van der Waals bonding, which is very weak bonding. And so you can easily remove a layer of graphene from graphite. A single layer of graphene is transparent, right? It's in fact 97% transparent, almost as transparent as glass. Many layers are black, and that's because a single layer is 97% transparent, so it's 3% absorbing of light. And so if you get many layers, each layer is 3% absorbing, and you get many layers, and uh, then it's black. And the lead in pencil, and over here I have a rather large pencil for a demonstration. I can't show you graphene as a presentation because it's transparent, all right? I am holding up graphene and you don't know if I am or not. So, so um, as like Bob Hope said, when, uh, when America introduced stealth bombers, he said, why do we bother to build them? Just to tell people we've got bombers they can't detect. And uh, so, so graphene, you can't see. But, but this, um, this pencil, the lead in this pencil is, is graphene. Uh, it's graphite, so it's graphite. And, uh, and when you use a pencil, you're rubbing off layers of graphene and many layers of graphene when you use it, and that's why it's black. Um, 
And also graphite is a very good solid state lubricant. So some of you know this, if the, uh, the key, when you try and unlock your front door, if that lock is sticking a bit, you can either oil it, or you can actually just rub some lead from your pencil, which is actually graph graphite onto your key and put that in the lock, and it'll probably work because you're using graphite as a solid state lubricant. And just to show you how thin graphene is, three million layers of graphene are needed to form a one millimeter thick block of graphite. So it's incredibly thin, the thinnest material known, and it's very plentiful. So the UK has graphite mines all over the world, there are graphite mines, for example, in Cumbria. Graphite comes from the German word graphite. Graphite is derived from the Greek word graphene, which means to write. And graphite has been used for writing from ancient times, from at least as, at least as far back as 500 BC. We know civilizations there were digging up graphite and using it for writing. The lead in pencils is actually not pure graphite, it's a mixture of graphite and clay. So why did uh, these two people in Manchester, Graham and Novoselov, get the Nobel Prize? They got the Nobel Prize for what is called isolating graphene from graphite. And what they did was very simple. They took a blot of graphite and they put sticky tape, so sellotape or scotch tape, on each side of this block of graphite, and they just pulled the scotch tape apart, and then they were splitting the graphite into two. Then they put another piece of sticky tape on and pulled apart again, and they kept on doing this until they got down to a single layer of graphite, and that single layer of graphite was graphene. And so they got the Nobel Prize for using sticky tape, which is slightly unfair, as I'll say in a moment. And what is interesting, and not many people know this, is that a that fellow in, the, in, the, in college here, Churchill College, who some of you may remember, Tony Kelly, he did the same thing about 50 or 60 years ago. And he did this because he was doing electron microscopy and uh, of uh, small particles, and you had to support the small particles on something. And the support material, you want to scatter electrons very weakly because, because you want to see the scattering from the particles on top. And so he used gra graphite and he peeled it off layer after layer. And uh, I don't know if he got down to a single layer, but he certainly would have got down to a few layers and used that as the support material for the particles he was looking at, because a few layers of graphene scatter an, an electron beam in, a, in an electron microscope very weakly. And so uh, he was able to image these particles very clearly. So Tony Kelly, you know, if he'd been alive today, had a case to be a Nobel Prize winner. Now, why it's slightly unfair to say that uh, they got the Nobel Prize for using sticky tape is what Geim and the Vosilis did, they did brilliant experiments on a single layer graphene, which is transparent. So just think about it, they measured the electrical conductivity of a transparent sheet they couldn't see. They uh, determined its mechanical strength. And so they did these, these brilliant experiments and so they got the Nobel Prize and then Later on, people in, in Cambridge, for example, Andrea Ferrari and others uh, did extremely good experiments on, on graphene. So graphene flakes, and also if you take a lump of graphite and grind it up to get graphene powder or graphite powder, these are being used today and they're being used to add to car tires where it said they extend the life of car tires. And they probably do, I think, and the mechanism there is that they keep the car tires cooler. So when, you know, when a car's running on the road, on the motorways for a long time, the car tire gets very hot. And that's one reason it wears out. And because graphene and graphite are very good conductors of, good conductors of heat, the use of graphene flakes keeps them cooler. Um, it's used to add to concrete, to give it a bit more resilience, uh, to tennis rackets, where I'm pretty sure the advantage is psychological. So if you, it's, you know the, where the, the sort of Y shape in, in the frame of tennis rackets, that's where the graphene flakes are added. And it's not clear to me it's very useful, but if you say to your opponent, I've got a graphene tennis racket, that gives you a psychological advantage to start with. And then if you win, he's gonna go out and buy a graphene tennis racket. So you can sell these for 20% more as they do than normal tennis rackets. Um, also added to running shoes more recently. But if you want to create electronic devices and manufacture, you can't use this technique for manufacturing. In fact, 
you know, it takes you so long to get down to a single layer of graphene. This scotch tape process takes about 45 minutes to do by hand. So um, you can't manufacture like that. So we need larger area graphene to make electronic devices. So these are some of the properties that Gaiman Novoselov measured. Um, very high electrical conductivity, 1000 times better than copper. So that promises high speed electronic devices. Because it's got a high electrical conductivity, it has very low resistivity, the lowest known resistivity, and that promises very low power consumption for devices. Um, highly flexible, so it promises flexible electronics, very high thermal conductivity, and this promises increased device performance. In fact, as Athene said, when I was uh, in Cambridge and before I worked on graphene, I was working on gallium nitride devices to start with LEDs and then electronic devices. And the, um, the power you can use for gallium nitride electronic devices or other high power devices, it's limited by the heat they generate, which you've got to get rid of. So gallium nitride electronic devices like transistors only operate at about one third of their capacity because you just can't get rid of the heat if you have to operate them at higher current densities. So if you have graphene devices, because it's such a good thermal conductor, that promises good device performance. And then high optical transparency, and this promises to replace um, transpa other transparent conductors, one's called ITO, which is in all mobile phones, that's indium tin oxide, and indium is a very scarce mineral. So, uh, so this promises graphene to replace you know, scarce minerals in, 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 um, in, in, in our earth. So what's remarkable about graphene is that all of these different world leading properties are in a single material. And that again makes it a unique material, I think, to help all these you know, some materials, some new materials have a single world leading property. This has this whole group of world leading properties. And so it's called the wonder material. And I call this talk, the wonder, the, the magic of graphene. So graphene, the wonder material, more conductive than copper, more transparent than indium tin oxide. Industries have spent a huge amount of money researching graphene because they want to scale up. They want to scale up to the fastest transistors in the world. So uh, tier one companies, these are major companies. Intel has spent $750 million researching graphene. IBM, 3 billion US dollars. Samsung, 2.2 billion US dollars. They all stopped about, two year, about a year ago because they were unsuccessful, they couldn't do it. So these huge sums of money have not actually yielded any commercial electronic devices. And so this is a problem to scale up. So where are all the predicted wonder electronic products? And you look around and they're not yet there. And so this shows some uh, newspaper quotations uh, promising what, what, what graphene could do. So this is the World Economic Forum. Pointed there. Uh, graphene could soon make your computer 1,000 times faster. And do we have computers 1,000 times faster? The answer is no. Uh, EE Times, Bosch finds graphene magnetic sensor 100 times more sensitive than silicon. And I'll come back to that, but this was assembled by hand from a graphene flake. And then graphene filters change the economics of clean water. As far as I'm aware, this simply hasn't happened. We don't have uh, water filtration with graphene, although it's been promised. And all these things have been promised because you can demonstrate them in the lab. You can demonstrate with small graphene flakes, but you can't manufacture like that. And um, this shows on the left-hand side, this is a graphene transistor, a schematic of it, but assembled by hand by IBM and 10 times faster than the silicon transistor, but couldn't manufacture. And Samsung made flexible, uh, conductive uh, contacts, and again, can't manufacture. And this is the Bosch Hawk sensor, uh, which is a magnetic sensor, 100 times more sensitive than silicon. And Bosch issued a press release when they made this by hand. And this is what the press release said. This was issued in 2015. Bosch creates graphene sensor 100 times the sensitivity of silicon, but unlikely to compete for five to 10 years due to the current lack of large scale wafer based and transfer free synthesis techniques. 
And they said that because they'd used graphene flakes, but the current large scale, uh, current large scale synthesis techniques um, were made by using this technique called CVD, which is chemical vapor deposition. And um, in chemical vapor deposition, you can grow graphene four inches in diameter or maybe six inches in diameter. But to do this, you have to have a catalyst to decompose the growth gases, and this is typically copper. So you deposit graphene on the copper and then the copper atoms contaminate the graphene. So it's contaminated graphene. And then to make the graphene useful, you have to take the graphene off the copper and put it onto a more useful substrate. And in that transfer process, you have impurities again. So CVD graphene is not impossible, but it's difficult to use for electronic device manufacturing. And so if we go back a few years, or just a, yeah, just a few years, the three types of graphene which people had available were on the left-hand side, um, exfoliated graphene, in the middle, CVD graphene, and on the right-hand side, these are graphene powders and graphene oxide powders, but none of them you could use for manufacturing devices. So now this is my involvement with graphene, how I got to be involved. So um, it was isolated in 2004 by Gaina Novoselov, huge publicity, huge amount of hype. And I took a positive decision to avoid it because lots of, if there's money, scientists move into it, right? And so uh, scientists follow the money because they need the money for their research. And lots of scientists moved into graphene, huge amounts were provided by the European Union and uh, the UK and so on. And there's just too much hype, too many people involved. So I decided not to get involved with graphene at all. And I was very busy with gallium nitride LEDs. And after that, gallium nitride electronic devices. Um, but in 2014, I was in India giving an invited talk and I was talking about graphene. And if any of you have been in India giving talks, you'll know that often you gave your talk and then afterwards, when you go to lunch or anything, you're followed by this crowd of Indian students who say, I want to work with you. Can I be your postdoc? Can I be your research student? So I had this, these Indian students following me around and uh, one of them was very persistent and she was called Pretty Gupta. And uh, so she really was very, very persistent. She said, I want to tell you about my research. And so I said, okay, let's sit down. So we sit down and she told me she was a PhD student, finally a student, and she was researching graphene and she wanted to come to work with me on graphene. And I said, I said, look, I'd love to have you, but I've taken a decision not to work on graphene because there's too many people involved and I'm very busy with gallium nitride. And she said, that is fine, Professor Humphreys. I will come to work with you on graphene. You will work on gallium nitride and together we'll make a graphene gallium nitride device. And she was so persuasive, I said to her, and I actually thought, that's, that's quite a good idea. And I said to her, okay, I said, I'll go back to England and I'll really think about this and um, I'll send you a message and, um, and I'll, you know, we'll, we'll do this if we can do it. And I was very fortunate because I had at the time a grant from the EPSRC, that's the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, called a platform grant, and they no longer exist. And I'll talk about it in a moment. Um, but a platform grant is wonderful because to get a platform grant, you have to have a track record of success in, uh, in other EPSRC grants called response in both grants and, and uh, program grants. And so I had these grants. And then if you had the success, EPSRC had a platform grant, which, which you give them to underpin your other grants. And what's wonderful about platform grants is it's flexible funding. So there are no milestones to achieve. Um, there's no Gantt charts to fill out, if you know about Gantt charts. And, uh, and it's just flexible funding, which, which is just wonderful. So on these grants, if there's some scientist from America you want to invite for three months, you don't have to apply for a grant. You just say, come over for three months, I've got the funding. So, and it's just ideal for scientists. And um, EPR says, well, stop this, because I think the ministers have said that these scientists are not accountable. You can't give them, you can't give them flexible funding, you know, they'll, they'll misuse it and uh, you'll not be accountable. So they stopped it, which is, which is dreadful really, because it's just such a, such a great grant to have. Anyway, so I had flexible funding. So I knew I could um, bring Pretty, pretty Gupta over for, for a year and, and um, do some research. And I also, with a gallium nitride research, I was collaborating with a Manchester physicist called Phil Dawson, 
who sadly died earlier this year, but he was a great friend. And I said to Phil, we're having this meeting in Manchester together you know, in a week's time. Do you think you can contact Costa and the Bosolith and get me a meeting with him? And I'll discuss with him if he can supply the graphene, because I needed graphene, graphene for Garim, Garim nitride graphene device. So he did this. So I sat in Costa's study and I explained to him that uh, if he could survive, provide the graphene, I could provide a gallium nitride. I could also provide a postdoc who would actually assemble by hand, uh, well, would assemble a, 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 a device. And we decided the device we would make is called a gallium nitride graphene tunnel junction transistor. So, so this is what happened. So I was able to bring the Indian student over for a year and she arrived in early 2015. And um, I provided a two inch wafer Five, well, a five centimeter wafer, or if Boris Johnson's listening, a two inch wafer, all right. And, uh, in England, we now inch towards metrication. Um, so, so, uh, so, and Costa was applied the graphene. And so I sent her up to Manchester with this two inch gallium nitride wafer. And, you know, I had no background in graphene. So I just expected his supply two inches of graphene to put on top of this wafer, even though it's transparent, but that's what I expected. And, and it actually pretty came back with these tiny transparent graphene flakes, a few millimeters across, we believed. Uh, that's what he told us. And uh, transparent. And she tried to, she tried to assemble this. And also you have to put contacts on the top when you've done this. And she just couldn't do it. And, and uh, so I phoned him and I said, you know, she can't do this because it's transparent and only a few millimeters across. I said, can you supply a piece of graphene, uh, five centimeter across, which will match our five centimeter gallium nitride substrate. And she has a chance then of putting this on top. And he roared with laughter. And I said, why are you laughing? And he said, Colin, device quality graphene, five centimeter across does not exist anywhere in the world. And uh, this was just news to me because I was ignorant of the field. And so I then had my weekly gallium nitride research group meeting and I said, uh, can anyone here think of a new way to make large area graphene because CVD graphene isn't really good enough to be making devices. And so uh, as it happened, um, my group was growing nitro based devices using a technique not called CVD, but called MOCVD, which is metal organic chemical vapor deposition. And I had in my group three of these uh, kits of MOCVD one funded by industry and two funded by the EPSRC. And a month later, I had a senior postdoc in my group and he said, Colin, I have an idea to make graphene using MOCVD. Now, you may think that's a pretty obvious thing to say, but actually it wasn't obvious because for making organic materials, the standard method was CVD, chemical vapor deposition. And MOCVD was only used if you had metals in the gaseous, in the precursors. So when we grew gallium nitride, you know, MOCVD because of, a, because of the metal. Um, and, but MOCVD is a growth technique which not only uses metal precursors, it's much more sophisticated than CVD. So a CVD equipment may cost up to 200,000 pounds. MOCVD is one to two million pounds, right? It's very much more sophisticated. And, um, and in CVD, you have to use a metal catalyst, as I said, to decompose the growth gases. And what um, Simon Thomas had was an idea to decompose the growth catalyst, an idea to decompose the growth gases in uh, MOCVD, which didn't involve a metal catalyst. So, and also then also you, you deposited it on a substrate you wanted, so you didn't have to transfer to a more useful substrate. So in MOCVD, no metal catalyst was used. So you don't have that contamination. You can grow graphene directly on the substrate. And I happen to have the right equipment in my group. Um, and I happen to have Simon Thomas who had great knowledge of semiconductor growth. And, um, and he really thought out the basic science of how he might do this. And so we were the first in the world to successfully grow graphene by MOCVD. We did modify the MOCVD equipment a little but the point was again, uh, the new growth gases he wanted, I could just supply them because I had a platform grant. So nothing was held up. If I'd written a grant proposal to say, we want to grow graphene by MOCVD, I think it would have been turned down. People would say, you know, 
it's rubbish to do this. And we've since learned that a number of people in the world have tried to do this and they've failed. And sadly, when experiments fail, people don't publish, don't publish papers saying so experiments have failed. So we just found out that in Germany, for example, a group has spent three years before us trying to grow graphene by MOCD and just given up. So, um, but again, the, the platform grant, I could just use this for fast funding. So if anyone's here for MOCBD or sitting on MOC committees or something, and um, uh, uh, Athena prob probably does, a good message to give to EPSRC is to bring back platform grants because flexible funding is just so useful for scientists. So um, I had the senior postdoc, Simon Thomas, who, so, who uh, had this new idea. Another postdoc called Ivor Guinea helped him and we used metal organic chemical vapor addition. And um, we demonstrated, or they demonstrated in my group, that this was going to be successful. So we patented this in 2015 because it hadn't been patented. And uh, no metallic contamination, no transfer process, promising for next generation devices. And we set up a paragraph to exploit the research. And um, we moved quite rapidly. So we got seed, what's called seed funding in 2017, October 2017. Uh, we moved into premises in 2018, and we now have over 60 employees. So it's really expanded very rapidly. And this is what the UK wants, especially after Brexit. If we're going to survive, we need new interests coming, which is going to employ people and produce new products. So um, it's very important that you know lots of people do this. And um, I'll just tell you this interesting story. Interesting story. So where do we set up our company? So we went to the Cambridge Science Park. And the Cambridge Science Park is almost full. It's highly successful, but it's also very expensive. And the, um, the area of, of we wanted, uh, premises in Cambridge Science Park, we, was, we were told it, it would cost us £100,000 a year uh, to, to, to have this. And so we actually went all over the country looking where we're going to set up our science park, <laughs> so where we're going to set up Paragraph. And uh, we were phoned up by an estate agent who said in Somersham, which some of you may know is north of Cambridge, um, a farmer has decided to put up these big sheds on his land and call it a business park. And it's a tenth the price of the Cambridge Science Park. So we uh, got this building on, on the left there and it was an empty, it had no windows in, we put those in. Empty shed, it had no electricity, it had no water, we moved in in February 2018, and the day we moved in, it snowed. How do we know it snowed? Because of the hole in the roof of this shed and the snow came in. So we got the farmer to do this roof repair. But then what we did, we took, we've got nice buildings inside. So this is just a sort of outer shell, put windows in it. Inside there's offices carpeted and painted, and we just installed a clean room in there. And, um, and, uh, and you can park there and everything, you know, so, so it's a, uh, it's, it's a, uh, a good place to be. Um, so, but it, but it's of course it just saved a lot of money because the rentals rentals so small, and uh, so that's a, a home in Somersham, and uh, we can grow uniform large area layers of monolayer graphene, hundred percent coverage of the substrate. We can dope it with impurities, which are, they're important impurities. It's something you want to do like doping semiconductors. We can do this during growth, um, and. Uh, our first product is a graphene hall effect sensor. Why is that our first product? Because when we were raising funds from investors, we told them the Bosch story, that Bosch had done this by hand, and then they said it couldn't be done because there was no you know, large area method. So our investors said to us, okay, show that Bosch was wrong, and you go and grow a, a magnetic hall sensor. So that, this is why it's our first product. And um, it's a fortunate first product because it's very simple. It's just a monolayer graphene on sapphire. Um, so the Hall effect, some of you will be scientists and, and you'll know this. This is a diagram of the Hall effect. So you have a, a material. The Hall effect happens in almost any material. It happens in semiconductors a lot. It happens in metals and it happens in, uh, in graphene. Um, so you have a, have a material and a magnetic field B, say, is, is coming up at right angles through this material. And then you apply at right angles to the material and to the magnetic field. You apply a voltage, which is called V in on this diagram. And uh, be in, it may, it, a current flows then through this material, and uh, okay, from that that direction through the material, the electrons go, and uh, and the magnetic field deflects the electrons by what's called a Lorentz, a Lorentz force, and it deflects them sideways like this, and that generates a potential difference. 
And you can measure this potential difference, let's call the whole voltage. And it's a very simple equation which relates the whole voltage to this input voltage and to the magnetic field. So if you know what the input voltage is and the whole voltage is, then you can say what the magnetic field is. So it's a very sensitive detector of magnetic fields. And uh, Hall sensors are very widely used. In fact, billions are sold every year. And the simplest way, of course, is just to measure. You can plot out, this is a magnet, use a Hall sensor. You can just move this around and plot out the magnetic field around ma a magnet. Or if you have a piston, a metallic piston, you can have a, a magnet here plus a Hall sensor and a magnet here plus a Hall sensor. And when the piston's at the top, you get a certain uh, magnetic field. When you move the piston down, then the magnetic field is changes. So you can detect a changed magnetic field. When it comes down here, this magnetic field changes. So you can determine where the piston is and the speed that the piston's going. And the next slide, please. And this shows you uh, how a Hall sensor also can be used to determine rotation. So these are, these are two rotating objects, bits of metal. And every time, this is a magnet with a Hall sensor in the front. Every time they cross the Hall sensor, then the magnetic field changes, the Hall sensor detects that. Or you can have a gear wheel and a magnet, Hall sensor, and uh, detects the rotation of speeds. So you can detect the rotation of shafts, rotation of uh, gear wheels. You can detect uh, current. So this is a wire. If you have a wire going along, there's a magnetic field around the wire, and you can detect that without touching the wire so you can measure electric currents. So it's very versatile sensor that we're using. And let's have a look now at the properties of this graphene Hall sensor. I'm watching my watch carefully, right? Properties of this sensor. So the sensitivity is measured in volt per amp Tesla. That means if you have a magnetic field of one tes Tesla passing through the material and you pass a current of one amp through it, then the Hall voltage is one volt. Uh, and a silicon Hall sensor, which are the most common Hall sensors used, your car, has between 20 and 50 silicon Hall sensors in, right? And uh, quite, quite amazing, very, very widely used. It has a sensitivity, silicon has a sensitivity of 70. A compound semiconductor like gallium arsenide, a quantum well, has a sensitivity of 850 volts per amp Tesla. The Bosch Flake, if you read their paper, was 1 to 50 volts per amp Tesla. Our graphene, manuf our graphene Hall sensor is 2000 volts per amp Tesla, and it's manufacturable. So it's 30 times better than silicon, but also it can do things which silicon cannot do. So it can work at cryogenic temperatures. It can work at less than 100 millikelvin. That's the lowest temperature we've tried it. So I'm sure it will work lower still. The minimum temperature a silicon hall sensor can operate at is about 230 Kelvin, because I think the carriers get frozen out at lower temperatures. So we have a sensor, well, really a, a cryogenic sensor um, maximum operating temperature is limited by the packaging that we're using at the moment. Very radiation resistant, we've had it tested by MPL. Maximum magnetic field, 30 Tesla. The maximum for a semiconductor Hall sensor is one Tesla. So this is a huge, huge increase in performance for measuring high magnetic fields. Very low power consumption, 100 times lower than silicon. This is important if you want to use this, say, on a space satellite then the power consumption is, is, is really important for any instrumentation on a space satellite. And it operates in these harsh environments. And so this summarizes some of these. High sensitivity up to 2000 volts around Tesla, very wide field range, wide temperature window. It can operate at high frequencies, high voltage capability greater than 200 volts. I think uh, for silicon, it's less than 200 volts. Low power operation, nanowatts, really low power. There's something called the planar Hall effect I won't go into, but uh, because it's so thin, then it's um, not sensitive to, to magnetic fields at, you know, at an angle, as it were. And so it, it's, it's very accurate for measuring uh, magnetic fields and resolution in parts per million for measuring the, the magnitude of the magnetic field. And this diagram shows one of our packaged Hall sensors. And um, this is a qualitative sort of graph, well, not a graph, qualitative table. And so the top line shows the sensitivity of a silicon hall sensor, a specialized gallium arsenide hall sensor, and then different types of magnetic field sensors. So a magnetoresistive sensor, what's called a flux gate, 
and NMR, and then paragraph. So NMR and flux gates are more sensitive than paragraph, but they're very much bigger. They, you know, these are large pieces of equipment. So paragraph, not as good as those. But when we look at field range, magnetic field range, paragraph wins very easily. When you look at the planar hall effect, and this is the accuracy, paragraph wins easily. Low temperature, paragraph wins. High frequency, paragraph wins. Low power use. So if you, I mean, it's very qualitative, right? If you count up the ticks, as it were, then, then the graphene hall sense has 29, and these others are much lower. So if you look at overall performance, then it, it really is, um, it is, I think, the best overall hall sensor in the world and, and the best overall uh, way of measuring magnetic fields. So this shows the power of graphene that you can scale up and it's a sort of proof of concept device that you can do this. And now I'll just talk about a few applications towards the end of the talk. Um, so we've got a, par a partnership with CERN because in the next upgrade of the Large Hadron Collider in CERN in Geneva, uh, what they want to do is to have this ring of superconducting magnets, which is, this is a 27 kilometer ring of superconducting magnets in Geneva. And uh, they want to know the, sorry, pressing the wrong button. They want to know the, in detail, the magnetic field all around this ring in detail. And they want 10,000 of these sensors to do this measurement. And so, um, and, and, and the planar hall effect is very important for them because of the accuracy. So, um, so that, that we're collaborating with them to develop sensors specifically for the CERN device. Uh, then we're working with an aerospace company, okay, Rolls-Royce for their uh, next generation planes for short distances, so internal flights, and they'll have all electric engines, so, so um, no carbon emissions, and they're interested in using our whole sensors in those for optimizing the performance of their, of their, of their electric engines. Um, we're talking to a company that launches small satellites in space, and they wonder if our whole sensors are so sensitive that we can map the magnetic field of the Earth from space and detect changes in the magnetic field of the Earth from space. And also for avoiding collisions with other satellites, which is increasingly important. Um, and then uh, for uh, batteries in electric cars. Uh, so, so a battery in an electric car, you, you, uh, a, a current flows through these cells in the battery when you're using it. Uh, and when you're discharging it, and then when you're charging it, current flows through again. If you've got a defect in a cell, then you tend to have a hot spot where the current either increases a lot or decreases a lot. And so the current changes locally, and therefore the magnetic field changes locally. And we've got an array of small hall sensors to put in situ on the cell. And uh, this can be monitored in real time. And so the hope is you can detect an early signs of failure of uh, batteries. In, in electric cars. And uh, right, I need to finish about now. So let's see, I'm always I'm almost at the end. Let's, uh, I'll, I'll talk about this. So this is a project which I'm keen to start. I'm trying to raise funds for an Indian student to come and do this, but bowel cancer, 700,000 deaths worldwide each year. Second most common cancer in women, third in men. Um, the problem is it's detected at a late stage. That's why it kills so many people. And so the idea here is to have magnetic, magnetic nanoparticles, coat them with a protein, which attaches itself selectively to precancerous polyps in the bowel. Um, squirt this up the bowel, and then the magnetic nanoparticles, coat it with the proteins, will attach themselves. And then we have a magnetic sensor to a robotic arm, a colonoscopy arm, um, which is then inserted and uh, I, yes, inserted up the bowel. I do say smaller sensor, please. So our sensors at the moment, <laughs> uh, uh, they're not too, they're, they're one centimeter by a centimeter, right? But we're working on a millimeter by a millimeter, which would be, which would be better. Um, and uh, so the sensor will then detect the magnetic nanoparticles, therefore detect the polyps, therefore you can remove them with a robotic arm. So that's the, uh, that's the idea. It may not, it may not work on this research product, but it's, uh, there's a cancer surgeon in Bart's hospital who's very keen on this, and and, uh, and he says basically bowel cancer treatment hasn't hasn't advanced in 30 years, is what he says. Right? So so this early stage of detection, um, so could save many lives each year. Um, 
Electron micrographs are not mine, but it just shows you impurity atoms in graphene can go in different places. This is the final slide. So we've pioneered this new way, metal organic chemical vapor decision, to make low cost, high quality, large area graphene. Our whole sensor is, I think, the best performing whole sensor in the world. And that's a proof of concept device, essentially. It could replace, I didn't talk about this, could replace ITO. Um, and it raises then expectations that we could have really sensitive graphene biosensors, science, graphene biosensors and graphene transistors that may be manufacturable. And if they are, they'd be transformative. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Brilliant, <laughs> wonderful you. overview. Um, I realize I've come up here without my reading glasses. The questions are coming in, can I read them? Um, so while people in the room, um, yeah, if you could bring my back up. <laughs> didn't think of that. I got my laptop all set up, didn't think about my reading glasses. So um, first question. It's almost philosophical, I think. I, uh, this is from Brown Stoker. I thought that graphene was the philosopher's stone of a new revolution, but I've not seen it. What is happening? <laughs> right, thank you. So, so, so the early experiments on the graphene flakes yielded these remarkable results. You know, that um, graphene conductivity was 1,000 times greater than copper and the strength was stronger than steel and so on. Um, but it hasn't proved possible to scale it up and make useful... Make, make useful electronic devices from it. So that's basically what's happening. Uh, the philosopher's stone has been too small, you know, you need to <laughs> scale it up. And so that's what we're trying to do. And um, do feel free to raise your hands. Colin, I will come to you in a minute. Let me ask um, a question from Garth. His question is, have you made useful products at scale yet? You've obviously made useful products, but when you're talking about 10,000, right. yes, yes, how long does it take perhaps is also the question. Right, so no, it's a very good question. So, um, so it takes to, to make uh, a graphene layer on a substrate um, of two inches across, or I put <laughs> Boris Johnson's mistake, right? Five centimeters across. Um, uh, it takes about 45 minutes, but then you get a lot of devices on that. And so far, I mean, we are a startup company. We're, ju we're just starting this at the moment. And um, it's an interesting market, the whole sensor market, because um, users of silicon hall sensors are very satisfied with them. So people don't want better hall sensors for motor cars. Right? It's what, so we've actually got to develop markets for our super sensitive hall sensor. So this is why we're working with with CERN and with uh, Rolls-Royce and so on. And we've just started selling. We just started selling um, two months ago, I think, two or three months ago. So, but we're, we're making them where the, the packaging is done by another UK company um, and we're just selling them, you know, singly and two, two orders, but we've, I probably can't say who we're selling to, but, but I mean, we, 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 we sold to Argonne National Laboratories, we sold to IBM, we sold to Oxford Instruments. So we are selling internationally in the ones and twos at the moment. And how long does it take to make, make each one? Um, the packaging and so on is largely done by hand at the moment. So we would, I mean, it's a very good question, yeah. So we need to automate this, but, but, there's, but, but we're using um, semiconductor technology in, in the packaging and manufacture. So, so it can be as quick as, when we're properly automated, it's as quick as semiconductors. Colin, so um, Annabelle, if you can give Colin the mic. Well, following on from what you've just said, we've got to get as quickly as possible to where there's a very large factory in the UK manufacturing for the world and wiping out all the other competitors. What are the obstacles to doing it and what needs to be done to overcome them? Comments from finance experts here, and I'm looking at one, would be very welcome. Right, now it's a very good question. So um, for large scale manufacturing in the UK, we need uh, large scale clean room areas. There are not that many. One place we were looking at quite seriously is Newport Wafer Fab, which may ring bells with some of you, because I think that's the government's in the process of looking to see if that should be sold, because that has actually been sold to an overseas company 
which has the Natural Overseas Company, I think, has a, a controlling Chinese interest in it. So the, uh, the government's looking into this, but that, that is probably what the place we would go to if, if it's available to us to do that. Um, another question from Garth, how would um, uh, graphene hall sensor compare with SQUID for magnetic field detection sensitivity? Right, that is a very good question. And uh, I don't know the answer to that. It's something we should, we should look into, yes. Um, I think it's a smaller piece of, I mean, it, you know, we are, it's centimeters by centimeter. I think the squid is rather large than that where you've got mm -hmm. all the stuff around it. Um, but we need to look into that. So I, yes, I, I don't know the answer to that. It's a good question. So we're looking for more questions from the floor and from Zoom. Um, the only other comment on, on, on Zoom was just, thank you for your oh, brilliant presentation. Oh, this is something coming nice. from Vienna. <laughs> And a very nice successful story. Um, someone wishing you all the best of luck. Well, thank you. Uh, while we're waiting for other questions. Ah, oh, sorry. Is it on? Yes, it is now. Thank you very much for your uh, lecture there. I found it very interesting. And we've talked a bit about the manufacturing side of it. Do you have any projections for at scale cost of the device in comparison with the other Hall Effect devices that you mentioned? Right, thank you. So um, our initial, initially we're aiming at the high end market. Um, so as we're selling a, a few, we're selling small coupons at the moment. Um, with mass manufacturing, I think there's no reason the cost shouldn't come down in the same way as they have for semiconductor devices. Um, and you know, the, the MOCVD technique or right, it isn't used for silicon. So I think silicon is probably always going to be cheaper, but the MOCVD technique is used for gallium arsenide and indium phosphide devices. And so the cost is likely to be similar to those. So it's been an affordable cost. So perhaps, I mean, you said that people are very um, happy, um, car manufacturers and whatever, mm. with the silicon based one. But you also uh, spelt out that the temperature, the operating range, the temperature was mm. much, much greater. Are there opportunities there for new markets? Right. Yes. So, so um, for the low temperature cryo market, um, Oxford Instruments is uh, we're entering into an agreement with them for their what are called dilution refrigerators that operate at very cool temperatures, um, and. Uh, I mean, I've got to be careful because I know I don't know what, what is confidential. But I just uh, so, so uh, IBM has actually purchased uh, purchased one of our whole sensors for use in quantum computing, which is done at very low temperatures at the moment. And, and uh, so there's those applications which I think our, our, our whole sensor will be uniquely helpful for. And then Rolls Royce is an interest in the higher temperature application because it wants to put these whole sensors as close to their engines as possible so so there's great interest in these extreme temperature ranges and i think you've probably just answered a question from an anonymous attendee who asked can you use graphene in quantum computers right yes so, 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 so i so, am <laughs> doing this yes, right, yes. um there's a, a a comment probably as much as a question from michael bell are you aware of the work in cambridge in the late 60s and early 70s at the old cavendish lab when it certainly continue um by the ps group pcs group notably dr yao liang on ultra thin including monolayers of layer structure compounds, including graphite and transition metal dical cochinides, which is always a word I have right, problems with. Yes. Uh, this work used the sticky tape peeling technique to produce the samples whose electronic band structure was then measured by optical spectroscopy and electron energy loss spectroscopy. Okay, so no, I, I, um, I didn't know they'd use a sticky, sticky tape mm. method. Uh, so that's, I did know some work had gone on with these materials to make them thin. And I should say, um, there are now a whole range of 2D materials. Um, graphene is, is said to be the father of them, but you know, that, yeah. there are these early yes. examples. And, um, and then there's, there's these metal dicalled cotonides, which are, which are thicker because they're, they're more than one element, but you can have your single layer of, of the molecules as it were. And, um, and they all show significant promise and it's great for the basic science work. And then we'll, we'll see what happens. And indeed paragraph, we will we wish to move into some of these other materials but we've taken the decision to concentrate on graphene right, first yes. um 
Can you use these whole centers? This is from Summer Kurdi. Can you use these whole centers in a scanning probe like magnetic field microscopy geometry to sense the magnetic field of nanomaterials? Um, yes, I assure you can. I think you can. Um, I know that someone's thinking of using this in an electron microscope where they're looking at magnetic materials there. And of course, you've got magnetic field from the lenses, and they just want to know what the overall magnetic field around their magnetic specimens are. So I think you can do this. Yes. Um, Richard Startup asks, how can you make use of the great strength of graphene? Right, so this is a good question. Um, graphene has great strength as it's a when it's a tiny flake, but when you make it bigger, there are inevitably defects and those defects will limit its strength. So I think, you know, people have been talking about graphene ropes tethering satellites. I think it will not, it won't be stronger than steel then because of the defects and the mm. defects will limit the strength. Yeah. Trevor. Without breaching, sorry, without breaching confidentiality, are you close yet to getting these things inside car traction batteries? Because several people be very keen to know about that. Right, that is a good question. Um, we, we have got a, a battery company evaluating them at the moment. Um, but we'd be very interested uh, in, they're moving a bit slowly. We'd be very interested in, in, in working with another battery company. So uh, if, if, if you could, you know, facilitate an introduction, if you know everyone, then it'd be very- I'll open. talk to you later. Oh, thank you, that's excellent, very useful. <laughs> that's Trevor Craig, okay, by the way, if you want oh, an introduction. You. Um, what is the life cycle of one of your MOCVD hall sensors? Does it have a high failure rate or is it high, highly reliable over a longer period? Yeah, that, that is a good question. Um, we... Right, so, so gra graphene is a very simple material, right? A single layer of carbon atoms. It is actually very difficult to use. And, and one of the reasons is it's very sensitive to the atmosphere. Um, and so uh, to use it, you actually have to encapsulate it. And if the encapsulation isn't perfect, then it's, you know, it, it deteriorates rapidly. Um, and so, but I think if the encapsulation is good, then it should last for a long time. So a question from Mark at Bristol. In general, do you think companies like Paragraph are able to move into running large scale manufacturing? I am researching Whittle and how power jets were not seen as able to run large scale manufacturing, hence the involvement of Rover badly, and then Rolls-Royce. Mm -hmm. No, that is a good question. So we are, very keen that the three that the three founders who are the two postdocs I mentioned that's Simon Thompson, Ivergan and myself, the three founders are very keen to grow the company and not to sell it. We're not interested in selling it. We are funded by venture capitalists. Um, at the seed funding round, we had control. We then lost this with, with a series I know we're just going through series B funding. Um, and uh, we suspect some of them may wish to sell and make a profit. So this is, you know, this is a problem for UK industry, Absolutely. but we are very keen to, to keep going. And um, uh, yeah, and, and certainly some of our, we, we chose our cap venture capitalists, to, to those with a long-term view as it were. So, mm -hmm. so we hope that they'll share this idea with us. Yes. Um, a question fr from Jürgen Ivanis, the, the, the chap who sent you his best wishes from Austria. Mm. Um, as far as I know, in the clinical environment, magnetic resonance imaging, um, the, the MRI Maxis 7 Tesla, could your new material technology improve MRI technology? Right, so that's a really good question. So um, the, I think the standard MRI machines operate at something like two Tesla, but the new, the latest generation, and, and they're happy with their, they've got, they've got all sense, they're happy. The, the, the latest generation are higher than that. Um, and, uh, and so we are talking, I believe, to the, to the manufacturers of, of the later generations where, where the you know, silicon hall sensors just can't manage these larger magnetic fields. So it's a good question and we're looking into that. Uh, do useful devices have to use just a single layer of atoms or are there applications for very thin but not single layer graphite? Right, so that's a good question as well. Um, 
We are concentrating on single layer at the moment. Um, and they will have different properties by layer uh, and trilayer, but we're not, we're not exploring those at the moment. Okay, and keeping an eye on the clock, I think we will finish with a question from an anonymous attendee, um, which is one we should all be thinking about. Mm -hmm. Is there a role for graphene in net zero green products to improve efficiency, et cetera? Right, so I think the answer is yes, because the power consumption is so low. So you're talking, it's, 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 um, it's, it's nanowatts power consumption. And I, th I think I put up a hundred times less than the silicon horse sensor. It's actually more like, uh, that was an underestimate, it's more like a thousand times less. So, you know, wherever you use these, the power consumption is extremely low. Um, so it is a very, very green product. Well, and I hope we hear a lot more about it. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you very you much. Very much. Oh, a super talk. Thank right. you so, so much. Thank you, I see you. Great session.